today with uh, adding a little bit more of fuel uh, to the fire regarding to the definition of the torus uh, by providing a, another interpretation in terms of um, hydrodynamical um, uh, models. So in this case, what you have is uh, the torus is just a particular region of an uh, inflow or an outflow where the dust is located in uh, regions that are optically thick and are influenced by the, by the B-field. So in this case, uh, if we learn from the uh, hydrometric model uh, made by Emery, Danford, and Slothman back in the 80s and, and 90s, um, these uh, bipolar outflows, or you want to call it uh, uh, polar dust, can be dynamically associated with an uh, inflow disk, where the polar dust is just basically a natural structure uh, from the release of angular moment of the loss of angular momentum uh, removed uh, magnetically by the inflowing uh, material. I think that this uh, HMD, uh, MHD driving model uh, gives you a natural explanation uh, and then the torus is just basically the interface between the inner part of the accretion disk uh, and the uh, inflowing material from the, from the host galaxy. So if we go and follow this model, how do, you, how do we measure magnetic fields? So I guess um, Pat Roach uh, yesterday commented that um, in the infrared, here in this five uh, microns to uh, or longer, um, we are dominated by magnetically aligned dust grains. And we don't have much of the contribution of the electron or, or dust scattering, which will dominate uh, a shorter wavelength. And synchrotron emission will dominate uh, uh, in the two millimeter or longer wavelength. So this is, uh, you want to study basic magnetic fields, the infrared wavelength is your, is your friend, is your best friend. Uh, the other thing that you need is high spatial resolution observations. So perimetry is a vector quantity rather than a scalar quantity. And if you want to, if you have a low spatial resolution and you are adding vectors in this case uh, for the right uh, side, uh, you are adding a, a simultan uh, distribution of, of vectors, you end up with a zero degree of polarization. So a high angular resolution will give you better uh, sensitivity. So of course, we're gonna start with 1068. So we did uh, observations at 89 microns and we observed a three kiloparsec scale uh, a magnetic field following the, the, spy, the optical uh, uh, spider arms of 1068. Basically what you have there is the coherent uh, regular large scale magnetic field uh, generated by the amplification of, of the field due to a large scale dynamo and also small scale uh, perturbations due to uh, star formation regions. Uh, but then when you go to the central kiloparsec, these uh, spiral uh, magnetic field uh, break. And what you have is the, uh, is the center magnetic field in the, in the inner ring. So if we focus in the center uh, one kiloparsec, uh, well, so it's being observed back uh, from the 70s. And I think the, First paper that I found in the literature is back in the 1974, where you have this abstract with two sentences, which I would love to write a paper like that, <laughs> that say that it's polarimetry in three and 10 microns, and the possibilities are all of the above, because at this time, the polarization was not very well uh, known in, uh, in AGN. So uh, thanks to meaning for the polarimetry, we know that the thermal emission is coming from magnetical line dust grains, and you have two different regimes. So you have the regime between one to five microns uh, that is uh, from hot dust, um, which interpretation is uh, magnetical line dust grains in the inner edge of the torus. Uh, and then you have uh, the mean infrared, where in the case of the, in the, night, in the late 90s or early 2000s, we didn't have enough spatial resolution to resolve the, the, the torus. Uh, but is uh, already giving a hint that the mini infrared is coming from um, directly heated uh, dust uh, radiated, uh, directly radiated from the, from the center AGN. So after that, um, then 10 years later, after the Chris uh, paper in, to, in the early 2000s, uh, we did um, observations of 1068 with Canary Camp. Uh, in four different bands uh, in the eight, eight to 12 microns. And here what you see the difference between the total intensity, very smooth 
uh, distribution with a typical tone um, in the north uh, area that uh, just um, uh, change from north south to 45 degrees uh, east of north due to the, the jet um, um, and the molecular cloud uh, interaction. And when you go to the uh, polarized intensity, it's like you have a chronography, a chron a chronographic observations in the, in the center. You have an unpolarized source and um, a very highly polarized uh, uh, area in the, in the north. Um, the interesting part here is like you see in the polarization angle in the uh, second uh, row, uh, you have the north always have the same position angle, and the south has uh, different the same position angle as a function of wavelength, but different position angle as the as the north. Um, this is more clearly seen in our mini in our uh, let me see uh, mini infrared spectrogrammetric observations, um, where we see that both. Um, uh, spectrum are, are completely different. So when we see the, the south and uh, we focus in the degree of polarization, the second row, uh, this feature you have like some kind of like a, a, a bump at around uh, 10 microns. And this is the typical uh, feature of uh, silicates. Uh, but when you compare with the, with the north area, you have a completely different uh, polarization spectrum, which we actually don't know exactly where they're coming from. Um, so after this, uh, our interpretation is the following. So we have three different areas. The north area is the jet molecular cloud interaction. So basically the dust grains are uh, heated by the, by the shock of the, of the jet with the, um, with the molecular, with the jet molecular cloud. Uh, and then you will not have any silicate feature. And when you compare it with the south, uh, you have a dust grains and gas heated by the jet and then it's distinguished by the, by the host galaxy and typically a silicate feature of, of polarization. And surprisingly, the core at an angular resolution of 0.3 arc uh, seconds uh, is uh, consistent with unpolarized polarization, where we um, interpret a self absorbed emissive polarization from the total. So you have uh, multiple line dust grains uh, that may be polarized, but because you have such a um, long column of, of dust uh, between the, the torus and us uh, is actually self-absorbed in the path through the, the galaxy itself. Um, after that, we did um, uh, a mini survey uh, as much as we could uh, before uh, Canarica was decommissioned and, and now it's coming back again, but uh, back in the in a few years at, uh, ago. And uh, we saw something interesting. So we observed a few radio quiet AGN, and they're all unpolarized, uh, at least the, the core. Uh, and then we observed Cygnus A, which is a radio loud AGN, as a highly polarized to 10% polarization. Uh, when we observe it, oh, thank you. When we observe it uh, in the far infrared, as Cygnus A, we observe it also in the far infrared, we observe also a uh, highly polarized uh, core at 89 microns. And we infer that the polarization is coming from multiple aligned dust grains directly from the, from the torus. That was the first observation of a uh, large scale magnetic field within the, the 10 parsec uh, region of, uh, of IGN. Um, so I think that, uh, so this is a, as, as good as we have done in the mini infrared. I think that moving forward, uh, if we do 10 microns uh, polarimetry in the ELT, this is something uh, that we can compare with current observation of ALMA at 0.07 or second resolution um, uh, observations, where we can compare, uh, we can actually resolve the torus, where I show here uh, with the Manichi observations. Uh, with ALMA, what we see is the, uh, um, the cold dust in the long, in the 10 parsec uh, region of the, of the torus, and we found a, a 10 parsec um, a toroidal field along the, the disk of the, of the galaxy. And then when you go to the north and south, you have these magnetic fields going in the north-south direction, which is are uh, parallel to the, to the outflows or polar dust uh, uh, the, uh, structure that you found uh, in the in 10 microns. And I think I can just uh, finish uh, saying that uh, the 10 microns uh, polarization uh, with ELT may uh, 
uh, give a, um, a lot of um, new insights in terms of the MHD driving uh, model, uh, where we can compare actually the degree of polarization or polarization flux as a function of the radio loudness, and it may give us uh, uh, interesting information about the formation of, of jets, um, evolution of the of the torus uh, itself, and also just say that might appear so ubiquitous at all scales. Uh, in, in galaxies of, as you have seen from three kiloparsec all the way to 10 parsec scales. I think I will finish with this. Thanks very much, Enrique, um, for keeping the time as well. <laughs> so there are some remarks on, uh, on Slack and people are stunned with the NGC 1068 polarization map. Yeah, thanks. So you have the Centauro say uh, coming up uh, in a few months, which is in the back, <laughs> which actually is a more interesting. It's a work uh, my tech field uh, of three per sec scale. It's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Are there any questions? What is the future of CC Paula? Oh, uh, Maybe uh, I think Chris is gonna talk in a few in a few <laughs> in an hour from now. So I go like give him the, the voice. <laughs> Do you want me to pitch in, Enrique? Yes, I say like Chris is gonna <laughs> gonna answer that question. As so it's <laughs> it's uh, it's here for a while, but uh, Canary Can doesn't have a long term future, unfortunately, at this point. Um, that's a wonderful question. There's a presentation from the Grand Tacan from Sergio, I think, tomorrow. So uh, let's lobby him uh, on behalf of the group and we, we can hopefully give it some more longevity. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yes. Thanks, Enrique, for a very nice talk.